Welcome to week five. This week we talk about the impacts of wind energy on wildlife. The avian mortality problem of wind power is different than bird mortality from stationary objects. As explained by the seed study, wind farms have been documented to act as both bait and executioner. Rodents taking shelter at the base of turbines multiply with the protection from raptors, while in turn their greater numbers attract more raptors to the farm. Wind turbines kill approximately 37,000 birds a year, and that's a 2003 estimate. Some suggest that the available evidence shows no serious population effects from current installations, except for Altamont Pass in California. However, this is site-specific and wind companies are responsible for reporting bird mortality, and that's assuming also that carcasses from strikes are readily found. Most birds killed by turbines are nocturnal migrating songbirds. We need species, population, region, and installation specific studies. These can be done by wind companies if requested by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or other authority. Site selection for wind projects can often determine the magnitude of impact. For example, siting within a known raptor migratory flyway would greatly increase raptor mortality from wind blade, blade strikes. Turbine density can also influence impacts. Wind turbines can have a significant effect on bats as well. Bat collision mortality at wind fa facilities is widespread. Western states with fata fatalities include Washington, Oregon, California, Wyoming, and Colorado. Other states with fatalities include West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Bat mortality has also been documented in Canada, Germany, Sweden, Spain, and Australia. Bat mortality in the West is lower than in the Midwest and the East, and you can look at this in the lecture notes if you want to spend some time on this chart. Wind turbines in the Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland area kill enough bats to cause concern for population effects, especially as numbers of turbines increase, but information is not good. Migrating tree nesting bats seem most vulnerable. 11 of 45 North American species recovered Un, were recovered under turbines. In eastern the United States, turbines on forested ridgetops, bat fatalities 15 to 41 per megawatt per year, much lower in other places. New studies suggest that pressure changes from blades may explode the bat's lungs. Some have suggested that the electromagnetic field created by turbines may actually, may actually attract bats. Other effects, wind installations and their associated infrastructure affects vegetation, streams, sedimentation, etc. Wind movement can be impaired. This can cause fragmentation of habitat, can change habitat type from forested to open field, for example. And there's a need for standardized pre and post construction studies. Wildlife and agriculture. Agricultural wildlife issues, impacts of agriculture on wildlife, Farming practices can affect habitat, crops can be both food and cover, effects of agrochemicals on wildlife are pretty well known. Impacts of wildlife on agriculture is crop damage. So draining wetlands prior to World War II, um, there was a lot of edge, fence, fence rows, more animal power was used versus mechanical power and small farms, small plot size. Hay fields and pastures were needed for the animals um, to drive the machinery, and it was a much slower paced environment. After World War II, we switched to a monoculture, we increased the field size, we do clean farming, so there's no fence rows, basically everything is wide open. There's less need for hay and pasture because we're using mechanical um, tractors and equipment for harvest and there's a lot of more direct killing of wildlife because of the methods used to seed, sow, harvest, all the things that go around the heavy equipment. The problem with modern clean farming is the tilling soil and removing fence rows increases soil erosion. One inch per 30 years, soil replacement is an inch per 1,000 years. High production leads to low crop prices, forcing small farmers out of business and the reduction in wildlife habitat. There's less need for hay fields and pastures. There are no woodlots in this type of farming. There are no fence rows and there are no unplowed strips of land. 
There are land set aside programs that help with that, the soil bank program. Farmers agree to idle cropland with plant cover for five to 10 years. Um, this allowed the pheasant population to double in South Dakota, for example. The cropland adjustment program, farmers agree to plant grasses and legumes for five to 10 years, and that provides nesting and concealment cover for waterfowl. Another land set aside is the Farm Bill and the Conservation Reserve Program. Farmers agree not to farm erodible lands for 10 years, and they use plant covers for erosion control, water quality, and wildlife habitat. The government pays the yearly rent and up to a half of the cost of the cover crop. The Swamp Buster section withholds subsidies from farmers who drain wetlands, and the Sod Buster section withholds subsidies from farmers who plow erodible fields. Importance of the CRP program is that it is four to 100 times more attractive than other cover types for nesting waterfowl, 2.4 million nests per year of pothole nesting in the prairie pothole region, species in 3.9 million acres of CRP, about 30% of total in the region, and nest success in CRP cover is greater by 20%. Um, greater than 15% is required for population growth. So it allows for continued population growth in the prairie pothole region. There are other programs out there. Partners for Fish and Wildlife in the Fish and Wildlife Service provides financial and techni technical assistance to private landowners. Um, Pet Pheasants Forever is about conservation of pheasants, quail, and other wildlife through habitat improvement, public awareness, and education. Ducks Unlimited conserves, restores, and manages wetlands and associated habitats for waterfowl. Crop plants are important food and cover for many wildlife species. The waste grain, for example, is food for upland birds, waterfowl, and mammals. Growing crops provide temporary cover for animals. Deer often live in cornfields during the summer, and the stubble provides winter cover for pheasants. Hayfields provide breeding habitat for many birds and mammals. And the timing of mowing is critical to wildlife survival, nesting, and success. However, crops rarely provide the same quality of habitat as the land cover that once existed there did. Uh, molding of grains can cause aspergillosis in waterfowl. Dry soybeans expand the gut, killing some animals. Mowing can destroy birds' nests and kill fawns. And there's an ecological trap, which is the exposure to agrochemicals. Wildlife does do crop damage, um, such as in some small farms, it can be extensive. The remedies are chemical repellents, frightening the animals away with reflective strips or propane cannons. And you see one shown to the right there. Fencing, killing problem animals, using lure crops to draw them away from your higher value crops. So some different management techniques. Managing farmland for wildlife, there's conservation tillage, which leaves an amount of crop residue to prevent soil erosion, so you're not tearing up the farm extensively, the land each time that you um, replant. There's reduced till and no-till, um, which is where you plant directly through the residue from previous crops. The benefit to the farmer is reduced soil loss and reduced fuel costs because they do not have to till first. The benefits to wildlife are cover and food and it reduces nest destruction. Reduced winter tilling leaves more waste grain available for wildlife. So instead of tilling the soil um, at the end of the season like they used to do, now if they leave it for the winter, there's more uh, food available for wildlife. And this method is blamed for short stopping when waterfowl remain further north than traditional winter grounds because of the food now available. So it does affect migration of waterfowl to have a lot of uh, grain left in the fields. Field borders, where you plant and leave narrow strips of vegetation around the perimeter of a field, about five meters wide. Fence rows and shelter rows, they're remnants of natural habitat, so they create, you retain or create snagged trees, for example, if you're clearing a field, you protect it from grazing so that it's available for wildlife. Shelter rows are used as windbreaks, so the shelter rows, when you see a long row of trees, 
Does it like a windbreak? It reduces transpiration, water loss, and soil erosion. And both should be managed to maximize vertical stratification. So in other words, you want to plant trees around your fields and on the borders and try to do so so that you have different um, heights of trees. So you leave some snags, you plant some shrubs or smaller trees, and you have then a variety of um, habitat at the edge of the fields or separating fields. Food plots, these are crops grown specifically for animals and they're useful if food is otherwise limited around the farms because it does depend on what those farms are growing. So planting a food plot specifically for wildlife help is one option. It will lure wildlife away from the crops that you are most interested in and have the most value and that reduces the economic impacts. And here are some resources on wind that you can look up in the PowerPoint lecture notes and some on agriculture that may be of interest to you.